by Joshua Achterberg. Um, so Joshua is a PhD student here in the Applied Mathematics and Statistics Department at uh, JHU, advised by Professor Carrie Preby, uh, who is also here, I guess. Uh, hi, Carrie. Um, so Joshua's research interests include uh, statistical network analysis, spectral methods, and high dimensional statistics, uh, with an emphasis on addressing theoretical problems in the mathematical and statistical foundations of data science. He's a Minds Fellow, as uh, was mentioned the first day. Uh, he is also an Applied Mathematics and Statistics Teaching Fellow. Uh, last year, he received the Institute of Mathematical Statistics uh, Hanan Award and a Best Presentation Award for his talk and paper at the Joint Statistical Meetings Student Competition in Non-Parametric Statistics. Um, so Joshua, the floor is yours. Uh, we are very happy to uh, listen to your talk. Thank you. Let me share my screen here. <clears throat> so thank you for the invitation. Uh, very honored to be speaking here. Um, so let me make this full screen. All right, so the title of this talk is Entrywise Estimation of Singular Vectors of Low-Rank Matrices with Heteroscedasticity and Dependence. This is based on a paper of the same name with Zach Lubritz, who is an assistant research professor in the Applied Math Department, and Kerry Preeb, who is my advisor. Um, so here's a outline. Here's an outline. Uh, and I will be glossing over just a few things in the interest of time. This is only a 20-minute talk, uh, so I don't want to be spending too much time talking about all sorts of things. So uh, if there are questions about the material that I gloss over, um, I'll request that you hang on to that until the end, and we can talk about that afterwards. Otherwise, uh, if it's just clarification questions, I'm happy to take those questions during, during the talk. All right, so let's get started. So spectral methods uh, is the motivation, and spectral methods are ubiquitous in machine learning, statistics, data science, artificial intelligence. Uh, here's some classical examples, spectral clustering, principal components analysis. This is a picture of the Wikipedia version of principal components analysis. A number of non-convex algorithms begin by the initialization of the singular vectors of some appropriately defined matrix. For example, in tensor SVD, you take the left singular vectors of the matricization of the tensor. So lots is known about the convergence in a statistical sense, in, in, in a consistency sense. Uh, of spectral methods, but less is known about uncertainty quantification. What we'd be like to be able to do is understand what is going on underneath the hood in order to be able to uh, make inferences and uh, find confidence intervals and do hypothesis testing down the line for these applications of spectral methods. Okay, so our goal is to develop fine-grained statistical theory for spectral methods. Now you might wonder, what does this mean? This is a little bit ill-defined at the moment. So I'm gonna be refining this goal over the next few slides here. All right, so we'll be operating under a signal plus noise model. So we have a low rank signal. We add to it noise, and this is what we observed. You notice the observation still had, retains some of the approximate low rank structure. This is in some sense a very simple model, but it still captures a lot of the main information that we'd like to tease out of this. Okay, so now we can make our goal a little bit more precise. We want to develop fine-grained statistical theory for an estimator of the left singular subspace of the signal matrix. Why the left? That's a subtle point that I don't really have time to go into, but um, it turns out that the left singular subspace uh, will be operating in a dimension where, where, N and where the, 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 the columns and the number of columns, the number of rows are of the same order uh, or, or the number of columns is larger. So sometimes the left subspace is all you can estimate. But uh, again, that's nuanced and a little bit technical. Okay, so uh, in many problems, there is heteroscedasticity and a dependence within each row of the noise. And I know heteroscedasticity is a big word, so let me try to explain it. So I think the, uh, a good example of heteroscedasticity is the high-dimensional Gaussian mixture model. This is the two-dimensional Gaussian mixture model, which is not a high-dimensional Gaussian mixture model, but it still captures the main ideas of heteroscedasticity and dependence. So what is heteroscedasticity? Heteroscedasticity is just a long word to mean that the variances are different. 
So here we have two, class, uh, two classes of uh, Gaussian distributions. In the second class, notice we have this sort of long and skinny covariance. This is the 95% uh, confidence ellipse. And in the first class, we have this sort of fat and wide covariance. So the covariances are different. Dependence in this setting refers to the fact that we have some correlation between these two dimensions, right? So in this dimension here, we've got some positive correlation. Uh, sorry, in this class, we've got some positive correlation. And in this class, we've got a little bit of negative correlation, just a little bit there. Okay, so that's what that means. So now we can refine our goal uh, even more precisely. We'd like to develop fine-grained statistical theory for an estimator of the left singular subspace of the signal matrix in the presence of heteroscedasticity and dependence within each row of the noise matrix. And you might be noticing that I've got a color scheme going on. So for this talk, uh, in order again to keep things concise, I'm focusing, I will be focusing on the geometric relationship between the signal matrix and the covariant structure of the noise. Uh, the signal matrix and everything referring to the signal will be blue. The covariant structure of the noise and everything referring to the noise will be yellow or it's orange, but uh, yellow doesn't show up so nice in latex. So uh, it's orange, but I'm gonna call it yellow. But blue and yellow make green. So the geometric relationship will be green. All right, so everything that every quantity that uh, concerns the geometric relationship between blue signal and yellow noise will be green. All right, so now we can state our model now a little bit more rigorously. We observe a low rank blue signal matrix corrupted by yellow additive noise. So we observe M hat, which is signal plus noise. The signal matrix is assumed to be rank R, where R stands for rank, with thin or compact or skinny SVD given by U lambda V transpose. The reason I say skinny SVD is because I'm discarding the zero singular values. So this matrix U is an M by R matrix of leading left singular vectors of M. In other words, its columns are orthonormal unit vectors. Lambda is a diagonal R by R matrix of singular values, lambda one through lambda R. And notice we allow multiplicity, we allow repeated singular values here. Uh, and V is a D by R matrix of leading right singular vectors whose columns are orthonormal right singular vectors of M. Okay, so M is in general N by D and U is the matrix that we want to estimate. The noise on the other hand uh, has independent mean zero rows of this form, sigma I to the one half Y I. Sigma I is a D by D positive semi-definite matrix. It is the covariance matrix for the ith row of E. I will say that again because this will show up again later. The sigma I is the covariance matrix for the ith row of E. Yi is a vector of independent, in general, sub-Gaussian, but you can think Gaussian, components with unit variance. Okay, and we actually don't need um, identically distributed for Yi. We just need independent uh, sub-Gaussian components with unit variance. Okay, so the rows of Ei have a covariance matrix, but they're linear combinations of uh, independent uh, random variables. Okay, so that's the model. So our goal now, finally, we've settled on a most precise version, is we'd like to develop fine-grained statistical theory for an estimator U hat of the N by R matrix U of leading left singular vectors of M upon observing the noisy M plus E, where E has that noise structure as defined on the previous slide. Okay, so there's a problem when the rows of E have different covariances, in other words, when we are heteroscedastic the left singular vectors of our observation M plus E can be biased. So the sort of vanilla procedure of just taking the left singular vectors of M plus E has a bias associated with that. In a longer version of this talk, I'd go into the details of why that's the case. Um, it's a fun calculation. It uses uh, all of my favorite uh, tools from undergraduate linear algebra and probability like cyclic property of trace. Um, and linearity of expectation, but uh, I don't have time to go into that, so I won't. Uh, but I do have that calculation if anyone wants to see it. So you just have to take my word that they're biased. So our solution that we propose in the paper is to use the hetero PCA algorithm proposed by uh, Anru Zhang, Yi Hong Wu, and Tony Kai. Uh, this algorithm was proposed specifically for principal components analysis, for heteroscedastic principal components analysis, but in general can be used for any setting where you have this uh, bias associated to singular vectors like we have here. And what this really comes from is the bias along the diagonal of the gram matrix. 
which stems from the heteroscedasticity. Okay, so we're gonna use this hetero PCA algorithm to de-bias the estimated singular vectors. I'm not gonna go into the full details of the algorithm. Here's the algorithm. Uh, just know that U hat is our output of the algorithm after sufficiently many iterations. We have a quantitative condition on the number of iterations. And the way the algorithm, in, it, the idea behind it is we just iteratively rescale the diagonals of the grand matrix. But again, we're gonna state theorems about U hat. So just know that it's the output of this algorithm. All right, so let's talk about some theory. So under some technical and regularity conditions and a signal to noise ratio condition that I'm not going to state here because it's got too much notation. Suppose uh, those all hold, define this matrix S super I as follows. Okay, it's gonna be lambda inverse V transpose. Remember V are the right singular vectors of M and lambda are the singular values. Sigma I is the covariance matrix for the ith row of the noise. Okay, so this S super I, notice it's a green term. It uh, only depends on the spectral properties of uh, M after it's been passed through the matrix sigma I. Okay, this is gonna be our limiting covariance matrix. Then as N and D tend to infinity, remember uh, N is the, is the number of rows and D is the number of columns, with D bigger or equal to N, bigger or equal to log D, there exists a sequence of R by R or orthogonal matrices. The, these orthogonal matrices are just to correct for multiplicity of singular values. They're not really of any consequence, but I wanted to make sure to state things rigorously. But there exists a sequence of orthogonal matrices such that the ith row of U hat, remember U hat has orthonormal columns, but not rows. The ith row of U hat minus centered by U, right? Uh, then normalized by S super I, converges in distribution to a Gaussian random variable with mean zero and covariance uh, R by R identity. Okay, so the ith row of U hat, of course, is an R by, is an R dimensional vector. And what we're saying is the R dimensional vector U hat is approximately Gaussian with mean ith row of U and covariance S super I. Okay, so the asymptotic covariance of the ith row of our estimator U hat depends on how the ith row of the noise matrix E interacts with lambda and V. Remember, lambda are the singular values and V are the singular, the right singular vectors. Okay, so the asymptotic covariance S super I of U hat uh, behaves, the, uh, the distribution of U hat uh, changes according to how sigma I, the ith covariance, interacts with the spectral properties of the low rank matrix M. Okay, and we can understand this just a little bit more. So uh, if we suppose further that sigma i, the ith covariance is equal to a scalar multiple of the identity, we still allow heteroscedasticity, but now we have independent noise within each row. Then the, we just look at the variance. So the variance are just the diagonal entries of the, we look at the limiting variance, the lim, uh, diagonal entries of S super i. And then just using the fact that uh, uh, v dot j is a, is a unit vector. This just works out to be sigma i squared divided by lambda j squared. So what this tells us is that there ex exists a sequence of orthogonal matrices such that the ij entry of u hat minus u scaled by lambda j over sigma i converges to normal zero one. So how do we interpret this? So the ij entry is the ith entry of the jth singular vector. The, jth left, the estimate of the jth left singular vector. So in other words, the asymptotic variance of the entries of the jth estimated singular vector are proportional to the jth singular value. And that's sort of intuitively appealing. Notice also, if we go further into the spectrum, in other words, as j increases, so we uh, look at further into the spectrum, the uh, singular vectors, then uh, this variance uh, will increase, right? Because the lambda j's are decreasing. So in other words, as we go further into the spectrum, our variance of u hat increases, which is also very intuitively appealing in my opinion. Okay, and so we're gonna finish quickly with a numerical example. Uh, let, me, let me pause here actually, in case, there are, in case there are any questions about what I've said so far, because the numerical example depends heavily on this theory. Okay, then I will continue. So 
Remember, we have this green limiting covariance for our estimator u hat, which has this structure. So what we can do is we can play with this a little bit, right? We can, we can uh, specialize sigma i to interact with lambda and v in a certain special way. So what we're going to do is we're going to define sigma 1 as uh, to be 5 times, 5 is just to give us some, some actual variance there. But it's, its leading eigenvector of sigma 1 is going to be the right leading right singular vector of m. So there's some interesting interaction going on. We're also going to set the second eigenvector of sigma 1 to be v theta, where v theta has the property that the angle between it and the second right singular vector of m is equal to theta. And it lies in a complementary subspace of v dot 1, the first singular vector, first right singular vector of m. OK, so our theory suggests that the first row of u hat minus u scaled by lambda is approximately Gaussian with mean 0 and covariance v transpose sigma 1 v. So if we work through the algebra of what v transpose sigma 1 v is, uh, this is just using this property and using the property that v theta transpose v dot 2 is theta, we see that we get a diagonal matrix here. So in other words, if we decrease the angle between v theta and the second right singular vector, right, as they get further and further um, apart, then our, uh, uh, sorry, I guess as they get closer, um, as theta goes down to zero is what I mean to say, then the, uh, the variance along the second dimension decreases. Right, which is what this bullet point says. Right, so if we change the angle, the variance along the second dimension will decrease, but the variance along the first dimension will, will stay the same. So what we want to see is as theta is decreasing, the x-axis dimension will stay the same. The variance along that dimension will stay the same, will be whatever square root, the standard deviation will be like square root 5.1. But along the y-axis, the variance should decrease, right? It should go down as theta decreases. OK. And so here we have a figure showcasing this. What I've done is we've done a thousand Monte Carlo iterations where we've taken the first row of uh, lamb scaled by lambda to just account for that uh, extra lambda that was floating around. U hat minus U, we look at the first row of this matrix. Our theory says uh, that it should have the covariance matrix on the previous slide. And notice in the first uh, dimension, the x axis, the variance stays the same. Right, the variance is approximately uh, two point something, which is square root of five point one. The variance along the y-axis decreases as our angle changes. So we start the theta is equal to 0 0.9, and then we go down to 0 0.1. We see that the variance along the y-axis goes all the way down, whatever uh, five times 0 0.1 plus plus 0 0.1 is. That's that's our variance for this last term here. The solid line is our empirical 95% uh, confidence ellipse. And the dotted line is what is predicted by our theory. And they match very closely. So this is exactly what was predicted by our theory. OK. And uh, there's, so I'll let everybody digest that for a moment before I conclude here. All right. So again, just to reiterate, we wanted to develop fine-grained statistical theory for an estimator of the left singular vectors of our signal matrix M in the presence of heteroscedasticity and dependence. Our estimator is based on applying the hetero PCA algorithm. Uh, our results in the paper, we actually refine the analysis in the paper that proposes the hetero PCA algorithm. We prove uh, limiting entry-wise asymptotic normality results for estimator in a high dimensional regime, showcasing the green geometric relationship between the blue signal matrix, the yellow covariance structure of the noise, and the limiting distribution of the errors through this covariance matrix S super i, which is the covariance of the ith row of our estimator u hat. And notice it depends only on the interaction between the spectral subspace of M the, the singular values of M and the covariance matrix of the ith row of our noise. Our results in the paper are stated as various scheme theorems. So we actually allow R to grow. I said the results for fixed R, but we allow R to grow. And we actually apply our results to high dimensional Gaussian mixture models yielding asymptotically valid confidence intervals, which is again, the first step towards getting uncertainty quantification for these spectral methods.
Okay, so this is the paper. Again, this is with Zach Luberts and Carrie Preeb. And this is the paper that proposes uh, the hetero PCA algorithm. It's been accepted to Annals of Statistics. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Joshua. So let's see if there are. Okay, so there's one question entry wise recovery guarantees for a sparse PCA. Yeah, that's from Carrie. Uh, that has to do with a slightly different result where we have entry-wise guarantees for sparse PCA. That's actually with uh, Jeremiah Suem uh, that just got accepted to uh, AI stats. We found out, I think, yesterday or the day before. But that's the slightly different problem where we consider sparse principal components analysis, where you assume that the leading left singular vectors, well, really, it's just the leading eigenvectors of the covariance matrix are sparse. And what can you say about those eigenvectors then? So this is different because we're in a spike signal plus noise model. So it's related, but not exactly the same. Okay, so that, uh, let's wait. Uh, so I have a quick question. So these matrices sigma i, which are the, the, the yeah, for each row, for each column of the noise matrix. So are these design parameters at the end? Like you get to choose these matrices, sigma? No, so this is, these are sort of, the, the, you have to specify there's N deterministic sigma i's that are unknown. And what we wanted unknown. to do is we wanted to tease out the dependence on sigma i at the end. Yeah, these aren't, these are, we were just playing with the sigma i in our numerical mm -hmm. simulation to demonstrate yeah. the theory, but these are not something that you would choose in practice. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. You don't know the covariance of your in a high dimensional Gaussian mixture model, you don't know the covariance at the beginning necessarily. Exactly. Let's see any other questions from the audience. I guess there are no more questions. Uh, thank you again, Joshua, for, for your nice and precise presentation. So that concludes uh, our third day of the workshop. So uh, we will have a practicum tomorrow starting at 11 a.m. Eastern time. It's about supervised learning function spaces. So it's uh, from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. with one hour a break in between. So I uh, hope to see you all tomorrow for this exciting practicum. Thank you so much for attending.